All right, great. Um, so I see uh, people starting to join. Um, thank you all so much for coming to our last session of this Friday night. Um, I am really thrilled to have um, a bunch of panelists here who I think are going to um, be really insightful and, and uh, give you some perspective that you might not get otherwise. Um, and this session is called uh, Inside the Building, What to Watch for in the Redistricting Process. And uh, everyone here uh, spent a lot of time uh, inside the legislature during uh, the most recent redraw and previous redistricting processes. So, um, so hopefully we can get some, uh, some really interesting insight from them. Um, so to go ahead and, and quickly introduce the, our panel, uh, we have Jane Pinsky, who is the director of the North Carolina Coalition for uh, Lobbying and Government Reform. We also have uh, Representative Pricey Harrison from Guilford County. We have Senator Wiley Nickel from Wake County, and we have Senator Natasha Marcus from Mecklenburg County. Um, so we're really thrilled to have all of you here. Um, you know, uh, just to start off, I think I wanted to have some perspective given, especially on the redraw we all went through together in 2019. Um, so as some of you in the audience may know, uh, we had some partisan gerrymandering cases against uh, maps that we had previously. Um, those partisan gerrymandering cases in 2019 led to some uh, court ordered redrawings of those maps. And so those went, maps went into the legislature. The legislature was asked to redraw them again without um, the extreme partisan gerrymanders that the court had found to be against our state constitution. And so um, there was this real flurry of map drawing over the course of, of two weeks for the state legislature of maps and two weeks for the congressional maps and it was a very very intense time i'm sure some of you all remember the um the lottery machine that was brought in uh, as part of that process <laughs> um so um what i want to do first is just get um some perspective from people on you know what it was really like being in there during the court ordered redraw um and i'll start with you jane um so what was it like uh, you know being in there and and how how hard was it to be sort of to an advocate for fair maps there. Um, it was a fascinating experience as probably everyone knows it's the first time the maps were ever drawn in anything near public view. Um, in the past they've been drawn in some back room that most of us don't know yet where that was. Um, so that was exciting. But the biggest problem was generally it was impossible to know what was going on. They kept observers, citizens outside of a perimeter so that we couldn't really hear what legislators were saying. Um, there were usually several people working at several different computer terminals at once. So unless you were working really hard, you couldn't follow either in person or online what was happening on one of those terminals. And I think it was even tougher online than in the room. And um, I will say in my experience, I certainly was asked to move any number of times until Senate leadership and House leadership finally agreed that that was a public meeting and that I and other citizens had a right to be there. Yeah, I mean, I, I recall that sort of all uh you know, maps being drawn on three different uh, computer terminals at once, like really impossible to keep track of what was actually happening, people going in and out. Um, to go to you, Senator Marcus, as someone who was sort of on the other side of that, what was that experience like for you? Because I know for us, you know, to watch it was really, really hard to follow, it was hectic. Um, so what was it like for you? It was a lot to learn really quickly. Uh, it was my very first term in the North Carolina Senate. And the only reason I got to be elected to the North Carolina Senate is that district lines were redrawn in Mecklenburg County to get rid of racial gerrymandered districts, which made the district I ran in the, for the first time the least bit competitive and possible for me to even be there. So I'm a direct result of um, repairing some of the worst uh, racial gerrymandering in the state. And then I was on the committee, the um, redistricting committee. And so I was, I was allowed to have probably the closest view, unlike Jane, who was told to move back and stay behind certain lines. I was at least allowed to be uh, in the committee room wherever I chose to be. Now, what was weird is they had, as you were describing, like a, the map making happening for hours and hours at a time in a room that anyone could come in and out of at any given time. And no one Senator, myself included, was going to sit there all day 
just to wait and see who might come in and try and watch and figure out what they were doing. So it was odd in that way. You always had the feeling that somebody's eyes must be on this, but there was no, it, was, it would have been really hard for any one person to actually keep track of every change. So in that way, it was transparent in a way that was hard to follow, if that makes sense. Um, it was public, but it was almost, it was almost impossible to follow, at least the little tinkering. And then there were um, rumors of people saying, be careful what you say near that microphone. <laughs> Once they, when they finally had microphones for a long time, there was no audio, only visual. Um, so that was odd. The, the process itself in the committee is always frustrating because everything is a partisan issue in the, in the General Assembly. And so um, Republicans decide who's on the committee and Republicans make sure there's more Republicans than Democrats. So we may vote on amendments or different maps or a process, but um, the most we as Democrats could do would be to raise an objection, but we're gonna lose the vote every time. So again, it was transparent <laughs> in that you could see the way the votes were going and what we were debating, but we had no real power to stop uh, Republicans from going down whatever path they decided they would go down. I think that's a really good point. I mean, it's very true that it was more transparent than previous processes in the sense that they had to kind of at least draw draw the maps in front of people, but it was so hard to follow. And, you know, even people who were mapping experts had a really difficult time figuring out what was going on. There was just so much happening. So in a way, sort of like the transparency that they, the way they chose to do the transparency was almost obstructive in and of itself. Like, I think that's really, I think that's really how it actually ended up turning out. And then house maps were being drawn in a different room at the same time, I think Representative Harrison could tell us about that, but you know, it was hard for us to just focus on Senate maps, let alone what was happening on the house side simultaneously. Yeah, Representative Harrison, for you being on the house committee, what was that, um, what was that like? Well, a similar experience. I, I do um, I do want to give credit for the fact that this was more transparent than any process that had ever taken place under Democrats or Republicans. Um, but I, that was it was difficult to follow um, because we had um, various groups of legislators whose districts were being impacted, clustered around different terminals, drawing maps with staff. I would hear constantly from constituents and other pub interested public observers about how difficult it was to follow to hear to um, watch that all play out simultaneously. And then you constantly had um, um, majority staff going back into the back room um, behind the dais um, and coming out with new proposals and new, um, uh, new, new um, lines. And um, I, you know, I, the fact that we were sort of handed criteria um, and handed the county clusters that were the basis for the map drawing um, the fact that we were starting with a flawed map, um, I, you know, it just, it made it, I mean, it was a much better process. I do believe there was some court um, direction involved in that decision to be more transparent. Uh, and, uh, um, but, you know, it's um, uh, when you are in charge of map drawing and it's not an independent body making that decision, it's going to be start, starting out in, in a bias in favor of the map, of the map drawers, which were the, um, basically the majority party. So I, I appreciate the opportunity. This is my first, I've been in the legislature for 16 years. I am in my fifth district um, due to redistricting, multiple court ordered redistricting. Um, and, um, but this is my first time actually being on the committee drawing the maps, uh, the congressional and the, and the, and the leg state legislative maps. So it was new to me. I did a deep dive into understanding the process. The law is complicated. The um, criteria, the factors are complicated. It's a very, it's, um, it's a comp complex process. And uh, so um, it's, uh, it's helpful to be up to speed. I'm grateful for your group for helping us and Jane's group and others who tried to educate us on the redistricting process. But my, I guess my biggest uh, takeaway from that was that the public was very frustrated in their inability to really understand what was going on and to actually have an input impact with their input, which was not necessarily always available to everyone, uh, the public online input, but they were given that opportunity. There just was a truncated schedule, there wasn't the opportunity to do the hearings around the state where you normally get the kind of feedback that you want in this process. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, um, and I think it was a good point you brought up earlier that like the transparency that we did see was really the result of the fact that the court had ordered that map drawing had to take place at sort of public meetings. So um, they kind of couldn't do stuff behind closed doors as they would have before. So that, that transparency that we did get probably wouldn't have happened if we hadn't gotten that court order. Um, so I think that's something that's good to remember. So something to keep in mind for this year when I think we're hearing lots of sounds that we are going to get some kind of process that looks similar to what we saw in 2019, but obviously they're not going to be, you know, operating under a court order. So there's a lot more flexibility for them to kind of handle it the way that they want. Um, to go to you, Senator Nickel, as someone who wasn't on the committees, but like still there during the process, what was that like for you, um, you know, trying to get access and trying to figure out what was going on as a legislator yourself um, during that redraw? Yeah, I mean, you know, they, everybody had access to the terminals to draw maps and, and do, you know, to explore how this worked. But but I just left that whole process feeling dirty. I mean, it, it is just not a process that people should be engaged in if, if, you're, if you're, you're a politician drawing your own maps. I mean, that was my big takeaway is we should not be doing this. Everybody, you know, was, was, was just concerned about their own map, you know, on, on one level or another. Um, and the Republicans were absolutely leaving the room, uh, consulting whatever uh, private resources or public information that's out there they, they, they had access to, to, and then they would come back in and make changes. So, you know, sure, there were cameras and you can see when people actually, you know, made changes on the map, but, you know, it, th this is not that complicated. If you, if you have, you know, a, your own map, a map you want to get to, and you know what that is, and you can do that privately, which anybody can. You go to just, you know, there's free access to, to, to programs online where you can draw your own maps and you know kind of where you're going with this stuff. It was pretty easy. So it just, my, my big takeaway was that politicians should not be part of this process. We should have an independent redistricting commission that draws fair maps for our state. Otherwise, you're always gonna have self-interested legislators doing things for themselves and in this case, you know, the Republicans had a map. They knew what they wanted to get. They listened to us. They worked with us on some small things. But there was there was there was only one direction that, that these maps were going. And I voted against them. You know, um, I, I didn't think it was right. I, I wasn't on that committee, but now I am in this next legislature. You've got Natasha Marcus, who did a great job on that committee, uh, on this on this Zoom call with us, and she's not on it now. Um, and, and if you wanna talk about how redistricting works in North Carolina, we don't even get to pick the committees we're on. She, she, I didn't choose you know, to, to be on the redistricting committee. Phil Berger put me on it. I don't know why, but, and, but he took Natasha Marcus off. So they, they choose the committees. I, I, I uh, begged to be put back on and agreed to go off a different committee to get on. And I'm actually, I'll be, I'm, I'm back on. So I'll oh, be good. with you there, Senator Nickel. <laughs> But, wow, breaking but we, some news here. Senator. Breaking news, yeah, that just happened on Wednesday, so. <laughs> um, you know, so that, that's, you know, it, it, I expect more of the same and I hope, I hope we can, I hope it goes to the courts. Um, so just to go back to someone in the chat was asking about county clusters, which I think Representative Harrison mentioned. So just to say, this is a unique thing that happens in North Carolina. So in our North Carolina state constitution, we have a provision that says you have to keep counties whole when you draw districts. Um, obviously, that's outdated. And so if you want to keep counties whole, but counties don't have the same population and districts have to have the same population, um, those things are in conflict. So uh, after a court decision in, I think, 2001 or a case that started in 2000, and one, they came up with this county clusters thing. And if you look in the chat, you can see I put in a link of a good explainer, but basically counties are grouped together and then districts are drawn within those groups. And so that's why we call it county grouping. So it's sort of this interesting thing where you make these like kind of mini states that get districts drawn within them the same way the districts are drawn within larger state. Um, so, um, so yeah, um, and, and also, Senator Marcus just broke some news, so that's exciting. <laughs> um, so what are some things that, um, I think Jane, I'll go to you with this on this first, but what are some things you think contributed to the fact that, you know, we got maps out of this 2019 process that I think we all think were better, but they're not exactly, I think, what, what at least what my organization would call fair maps. Um, they're not the like the the real nonpartisan fair maps that we would hope for. Um, why do you think that happened? What, what do you think contributed to that? Um, there are several things that contributed 
first of all, the county clusters are part of it. And some people seem to think that the county clusters we have now are the end all and be all. It would be possible to draw other county clusters and certainly as population shifts, we may have to do that. That sways the process. But this was basically the same partisan process that happened behind closed doors in the past um, because you had pe many people who had a vested interest in staying in office. And although the court said no partisan data, if you're an elected member of the North Carolina General Assembly, you know the partisan data about your own district. I mean, I overheard one member of the House say, you can't take that precinct out of my district because it shifts my margin from 75, 25 to 60, 40. Now that legislator knew exactly the makeup of what the precinct was that the other members of his county delegation wanted to move. And he was absolutely right. They redo the district and he lost. Um, you know, Jane, Jane too, like look at just the data from this last election. You can see all the competitive Senate races where we, we tried to, to, to win, to flip the chamber, and they performed just like they were designed to perform. All these races we tried to win ended up being about 45, 55 for Republicans. Those are the seats we needed to take control, you know, and, and you can just see what the result, you know, is they all performed about the same. Right, and, and we know that people drawing the maps or the people who really draw the maps have a lot of other data about us that never gets discussed, but they know what kind of car we drive. They know what magazines we subscribe to. They know what frequent flyer cards we have. They know where we shop for our groceries most of the time. They know where our kids go to school. They probably know where we worship. And they can draw a picture of each one of us pretty easily with all that information. You know, my Kroger, Kroger frequent shopper card probably gives them a good picture of me or did when Kroger was still here. <laughs> don't, don't bring up that loss. It's too much, Jane. <laughs> um, so I guess uh, sort of, uh, I don't know if um, Senator Marcus or Representative Harrison, if you have some, you know, something you'd like to say in response, sort of like what things that happened in the process that you were watching in the process that you think may have contributed to the fact that we, we didn't get the maps that we probably would have re regarded as really truly fair maps. I'd be happy to add. I mean, it's sort of like what Wiley said in his um, first remarks was that you had legislators from both parties up there at the terminal trading precincts to make sure that their districts um, remain safe for them. So it, both parties happened in both chambers and uh, in both parties. And that was very frustrating to watch because um, it just um, you know didn't necessarily lead to fair maps. There was a lot of um, incumbency protection going on. Yeah, I think that some some people in the chat were also saying, uh, mentioning that you know one of the criteria that's used in drawing maps in North Carolina is um, is protecting incumbents, and that you know since we do have gerrymandered maps, it's hard to do that um, without recreating the gerrymanders. Um, so um, I add on that uh, one of the details that I find very interesting is the maps that the Senate used as examples uh, that were, they love to say were from a democratic consultant and expert had created some example maps, which they were never made for this purpose and they were outdated and they had the incumbents from before the 2018 election worked in. And that was when there were a lot more Republicans in the Senate. And so they used those maps that, that was another way that they baked in Mm -hmm. some preference for them. It ended up in the end not to have quite as much impact as, as I was concerned and other Democrats were concerned it would have, but that was just one of those little details that escaped a lot of people's attention, that they're using maps with incumbents, with a lot more Republican incumbents in them. Many of those incumbents were no longer in the Senate even, that's how outdated the maps were, but they couldn't be persuaded, we tried, they couldn't be persuaded to use um, more up-to-date maps to even start with. Yeah, I think that that's a really interesting point. Um, so, so basically, what you're referring to there were um, during the case, the plaintiffs had used this expert to um, basically he had made all these simulated maps to to compare the current maps to, and um, you know uh, the Republican leadership was like, okay, well we'll just pick one of those maps and they'll be unbiased, but um, not understanding, like you said, they're using old incumbency data. They're also maps that 
aren't made to be redistricting maps, right? They're made as a part of a simulation, so they don't respect communities of interest or take into account any kind of public input or where people actually live. So, so they kind of did this weird sort of smoke and mirrors thing by picking these maps and saying they were from a democratic consultant when you know, they were never meant for that purpose in the first place. I think that's a really good thing to bring up that again, kind of in that same vein of like transparency, but like transparency in a way that in some ways is like unhelpful or obscure, obscurant. Well, and the use of the lottery machines, the lottery ball to make it seem like it's all completely hands off, you know, completely random. Um, but if you're in the room and following the process, you knew, um, but it wasn't as random as it appeared. <laughs> Those lottery balls didn't pick different maps. They were virtually identical maps for that they were trying to do with the lottery. Like, I mean, there was yeah, no- if It chose between the five most, um, the maps that ranked the most compact in the, on the compactness scores. There were a few other scores that they- Yeah, yeah. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I think that's another thing is that the maps that they kind of chose as the top maps were the, the what they used were, um, there's sort of an aggregate score of like compactness and some other factors. And then there were two or three different scores for compactness itself. So basically compactness got weighted a bunch of times. So you got really compact maps, but compact maps, you know, I think um, the interesting thing in our previous session, we had Allison Riggs talking about, um, about you know, how you can see gerrymanders, not just from irregular shape things, but she was making the point that, you know, in North Carolina, a lot of our municipalities are, are really weird shapes. And so you can draw a perfectly straight line and still be really cutting up uh, an essential municipality um, and acting like compactness is sort of the be all end all is not going to tell you real things about um, what the, what's going on with the maps. Um, all right, so, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, we should mention that at least six cities were split basically down the middle in those maps. Um, and Pitt County was split three different ways for Congress, for the North Carolina House and the North Carolina Senate, which doesn't lead to a lot of confidence in voters and, and, and their willingness to figure out what district they live in, which is one of the reasons why we need reform is that people are discouraged. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think um, also all the all the legislators we have here live in places that are real targets for this kind of stuff, right? Like you know, Wake County, Guilford County, Mecklenburg are all places that see a lot of gerrymandering have been racially gerrymandered in the past. You know. Um, partisan gerrymandering, you know, one, another thing Allison said earlier was partisan gerrymandering is racial gerrymandering in North Carolina. We have very racially polarized voting um, here. So, um, you know, you all you all live in these places that are really, really targeted and, and, and probably going to be targeted again um, for gerrymandering uh, coming up uh, in this uh, in this upcoming redistricting process. Um, so, so going off of that, sort of, what what are you expecting from the from the redistricting process this time around? Um, I know that, like I said earlier, Republican leadership has been making some noises that they're going to make it look similar to 2019. But, but what are the things that you're expecting that you would want people to look out for? Uh, Senator Nickel, why don't I go to you first? You know, I mean, I don't have a lot of confidence in in our, our current. Republicans in the legislature, they, uh, you know, I think what's something that's really important here for everybody uh, is North Carolina is very unique as a state. The governor of North Carolina cannot veto legislative maps. So Republicans have the majority in the House and the Senate, and they just need a simple majority to pass whatever maps they want. And they have the majorities on the committees, you know, so they will, they will craft a map and, and pass it. And so, I, I mean, I think number one, just the governor can't veto it. I think that's that's really important to start with, you know. I and I think they will they will do their best to delay the process. I think we will see that, you know, delay is really good for for ramming a map to pass the courts because it gives the courts very little time before candidate filing to make changes for for people, you know, like like us who are paying attention to this process to 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 get upset, to complain, to to make their voices heard. So you know, I think it'll take a while. Uh, I, I don't think it will be the maps will be fair maps, um, but I think they will. They know they know where the lines are, and I don't mean the district lines. I mean the lines in terms of getting the courts to go along with them, and that's what they have done well in the past, is delaying the process, 
pushing it as far as they possibly can. Um, you know, but we have a four to three Democratic majority on the Supreme Court. And, um, you know, I think they will be fearful of that. They'll, they'll probably try to include us Democrats to some extent. You know, I just, you know, I, I just am frustrated with this process and wish we could be a state like California or others that have nonpartisan independent redistricting commissions. That's the only fair way to do it. Any other way, you're just going to get interested politicians drawing maps for themselves. Yeah, Senator Marcus looks like you wanted to add something. Yeah, so um, my colleague, Senator Nickel, raised a few things that I just want to make clear for anyone watching. Um, there is no interest among North Carolina Republicans in moving toward any system other than having legislators draw our own districts, which is a shame because currently the North Carolina Constitution requires that we draw the, the maps. As Senator Nickel says, the governor cannot veto those maps and uh, we are not moving to an independent commission. They, they, they don't wanna do that. There's no interest in that. We'll file those bills again this year, like we do every year, but that's not happening. So we are going to have legislators drawing maps. And if the last decade is any indication, you know, we do this every 10 years when a new census comes out, the census, is, census numbers are already delayed. We got word last week that they were gonna be delayed. So that's gonna push everything back a little bit. We need the census numbers before we can even get started. And then we'll have to draw the figure out what the cluster maps are. I hope we have some input in that because as we talked about earlier, the way you draw the cluster maps really impacts how you draw the districts after that. Um, and there'll be no court oversight this time around either. So last time they were under court ordered deadline and court ordered rules. <laughs> and now there is no court order and they their incentive is going to be to draw maps that are the best they think they can get away with is, my, is the way I would say it. Um, knowing that litigation will come, but that litigation is slow. And just as they did from 2010 to 2020, they can drag out litigation and win a lot of elections with an unfair advantage while that litigation is drawing out. So unfortunately, that's where I see them. <laughs> that's what I, what, what I see head, heading into the next decade. Um, I don't see any reason why that won't happen. Well, can I add um, just the per perspective? I mean, I, I agree with all that's been said. And I do want to just reiterate that the Democrats did this too when the Democrats were in charge. Um, they just didn't have the level of specificity to draw the kind of um, micro targeting that is, one is able to do with the software now. So we can't forget that we were guilty of our own gerrymandering when our, our party ran the chamber. Um, I, I'm, I'm hopeful about this trend. Sorry, I got a cat cameo too. Um, I'm uh, hopeful. Just um, like I'm my black cat loves to walk <laughs> right in front, just the same. Yeah, I'm hopeful that, um, that we are going to be able to advocate for better transparency and better public input, because I think if you have those two, that will improve the process, process mightily. If the public goes out watching the process and understands and sees their community of interest or their neighborhood or their precinct split, then they can relay that and um, make sure that that's on our radar screen because these are important issues that ought to be considered when we're drawing maps. So if you were, if we were given advice to um, folks out there who care about this issue, it's just watch it, but advocate for the transparency and the public input piece of it first, and then watch it when it's happening. And hopefully we're going to have the hearings all over the state so folks can attend and make their um, make their uh, comments and interests known because um, you know if anything that just uh, you know, puts it on the record about what what the public wants to see in this re, in, the, in these redistricting maps. We had some pretty egregious um, instances like the split A A and T campus in my district, um, and others where um, we just we just can't let that happen again. I I think that there are a couple of things we need to start with, and as an advocate, I, I want to say everybody who's on this program should be saying to their legislators and to their neighbors and their friends and their family and everybody else that we need a minimum of 20 to 30 public hearings with 10 to 15 before the maps are drawn and 10 to 15 after the maps are drawn. We're gonna be a state with probably 14 congressional districts. We're a state that's grown a lot in the last 10 years um, and we are a state where the population has shifted. Our rural counties are losing population. Our metropolitan counties are gaining population. We need input from people about what their communities really look like. So that's the first thing everybody should be talking about. 
The, the second thing is that we need to talk about the process, which is not a glamorous, exciting, romantic thing to talk about, but the process should include one district at a time being drawn in each house. We will have time to do that if the legislature is willing to dedicate the time. And as Senator Marcus said, our census data, which usually we get about February 15th, it looks like we will get about August 1st this year, which presents a real problem for municipalities where candidates have to file um, before August 1st in some municipalities. And we should say not just legislative and congressional seats are redrawn, but cities and counties will also have to redistrict because population shifts within cities and counties. So it's gonna require a lot of vigilance and a lot of pressure. Um, I agree we're not gonna get a California commission this time. We're not gonna get citizens this time, but we can require more citizen input um, one of the things that would be nice would be for, as the maps are being drawn, for each of us to be able to comment in real time and for legislators in the room drawing the maps to see our comments. You know, if, if I notice that the line's going down my street and my neighbor's house is on one side of the line and I'm on the other, I should be able to comment right in real time to the legislature and say, you know, you're splitting a street, you're splitting a block. Um, one of the strange things I had happen this year was I looked at the splits in six of the cities and one of the cities that split is Siler City in Chatham County, which has a majority uh, Latinx population. So we went and we actually drove it. And I had this wonderful intern, Joe Martin, who's graduating from Davidson in the spring. I thought you'd <laughs> like that, Senator Marcus. Um, and he and I were driving down a street in a mobile home park and one side of the street was in one congressional district and the other side of the street was in the other congressional district and two little boys were riding their bikes in front of us zigzagging across the street so in the course of three to five seconds they were going from one congressional district to the other from congressional district four to congressional district 13 and right back i mean it's the perfect example of how ridiculous these maps can be yeah, Senator, a, you look like you wanted to say something. Yeah, I have another um, two things I wanted to say. One, I think um, to Jane's point that we need the public to pay attention and to make public comments. And I would just add that the more specific the comments, the better, the harder to ignore. It's not all that helpful to have a lot of people say, hey, we need fair maps. You know, that's they'll say, okay, check, our maps are fair. So you must, you know, that, that we need specific comments. So if you're splitting up my neighborhood and the, you know, talk about that um, and make informed specific comments because sometimes you hear, I'm sure no one on this uh, group tonight would say this, but you often hear things like, why can't they just draw straight lines, just make a series of squares and that should be the districts. Or, you know, Charlotte's a district and um, Raleigh's a district, but it, you can't do it that way. I mean, no one who knows what we're doing is advocating for squares or for entire cities to be together because the, that would violate all kinds of rules about equity and fairness and you know, equal representation. So we need people to understand what the restrictions are and then within those to make specific comments. And um, just while I have the floor, I was gonna mention another story, much like Jane's story that indicated how crazy it is to split a, split a district down a street is I often think, I won't mention the Senator's name, but he sat down in front of those computers during this most recent process. Um, and he was in public view trying to change the precinct lines in a way that would save his gerrymandered district because he wanted to stay in the Senate. And they allowed him to do that. Everyone kind of watched it happen. That's how I know it happened. And he moved things around and every time he'd say, well, how about that way? Can we do it that way? Knowing, well, if it was that way, I could still win. He'd say, and they'd say, no, that population is way off. You just made it much less compact. You can't do that, Senator. You can't. There, and he, so he tried many, many options and finally literally had to say in public, I can't, I can't figure out a way to save myself here. I'm out. And he stood up at that moment and said, I'm not running again. Like I'm done. 
And I thought, you know, these weren't perfect maps in large part because we were stuck with these preset county clusters and the judge only let us redo certain districts, not everywhere, not statewide like we get to do now. Um, but that was a really, to me, a really vivid example of how when you get, when you force somebody to follow some rules that a judge said are fair, it has direct impact on somebody. He's, you know, he's not, he's no longer even willing to run because the district is now not rigged in his favor. And that was a pretty powerful moment. Yeah, so to pick up on some of the things you were saying about um, about specific comments, I just want to say that's something that's like one of my hobby horses is that people really need to be talking specifically about what they want for their communities when it comes to their districts. And one thing I will say is that tomorrow we are going to have a session with Peter Miller from the Brennan Center, um, who's going to go through what they've seen to be actually proven to be effective comments in redistricting processes from how the public can influence the process and, and what are the characteristics of, um, of effective public comments. So I hope everyone comes to that one because I think it's it's one of my favorite things that we're doing for sure. Um, and and yeah, and I think also too though is like as you were saying, you know, there are other things along the way that really do make a determination, like the whole county clusters issue. You know, that's something that um, I think uh, before, you know, we just had to use the old ones in the redraw and sort of in 2011, they kind of passed by without anyone being able to analyze them. Um, but that's something that we can do this time. And similarly with the, the criteria, the rules that you all set up for yourselves as you draw the districts, you know, I think that a lot of times, um, you know, people did not have the tools, especially ordinary people did not have the tools to understand what are good criteria, but I think that, uh, you know, hopefully with, with all of your help and with our organization and all the other organizations that are coming together for this summit, um, we will be able to provide people the resources so that they'll be able to actually do that. Um, I don't know if anyone else wants to add sort of on the, along the lines of like, what are, what are the most important things people need to think about, need to know how they can best participate in the process this year? You know, I think Senator Marshall, you know, we're both lawyers, you know, we're looking at this in terms of building a case you know, putting information out there, you know, and public comments are especially important, you know, having people push communities of interest, defining that, you know, you know, if you are at a college campus, that's a community of interest, that's an area that has an important reason to stay together. So, you know, I think making that case is, is so important. And, and just for the folks, you know, remembering why this is so important, especially in North Carolina, you know, Governor Cooper was just elected for four years. I firmly believe if, if Republicans are able to hack the system and draw their own maps and get away with it, they'll have a veto-proof supermajority for the second two years of Governor Cooper's term. He will have no power. They will do what they've done before. They will sit in a room, draw legislation for everything for North Carolina, privately in a room. They will pass it on the floor by party line votes. The governor will veto it. They will override his veto. So there's, for me, there, there, you know, and, and for everyone here, there's nothing less than control of every single law for our state, you know, for the next 10 years, if you can, if you have maps that, that are drawn in a way to ensure an outcome. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Senator Marcus. And the way these maps are, are we also have to draw congressional maps. Uh, as I think it was Jane mentioned, we're likely to get one more congressional district and in that way, North Carolina's redistricting process impacts the whole nation because are we gonna have it tilted so far to the right again <laughs> that Republicans um, have too much representation in the US Congress? Um, that might happen. So we have to be aware of how what we do here affects not just North Carolina, but the nation. I think people should go and look at things like Dave's redistricting and District Ur, which is from um, Moon Dugin's group at Tufts, and play with the maps and be ready to say to your legislators now before the maps are drawn, these lines define my community. My community is defined like this because we are all of the same ethnic group or because our kids all feed into the same schools. My kids go to this elementary school and then everybody from that elementary school goes to this middle school, middle school and then they go to a high school. So we all know each other, that makes us a community. I think you need to be prepared, as Senator Marcus said, to be very particular and precise and say, you need to move this line three blocks because that's the shopping district that everybody who lives in this neighborhood goes to. And that is part of how we define a community of interest. 
So I just add a quick comment because it looks like we're getting ready to wrap up and you're going to questions, but I just want to say, and, and to all the points that have been made, the, the reason why this is so important is because the maps do not reflect the North Carolina electorate. Because they're so gerrymandered, they do not re reflect our values. And we are a purple state. We're pretty evenly divided. But if you look at the voting results versus the um, percentage of uh, representation, both in the state house and the Senate and, and Congress, it, it's not, it doesn't reflect North Carolina. And that, I think that's why this is so important. And it's not, you know, it's not about being Republican or about being a Democrat. It's about what, what are our values and who are we as a state? And when, when they get to that extreme level, as they did that Wiley mentioned that we had before, it, that, that's not who we are. Um, and you're passing laws that don't reflect our values. So this is why this is so critical that we get fair maps. And, and, and just to what something Natasha said too about the congressional maps, you know, they, they, they were for, for a good amount of time, 11 Republicans and three Democrats. And the guy who drew the maps is, is, is a former member of the house named David Lewis, now a convicted felon for stealing money from his campaign. This is the guy that drew the maps. And he said in a committee hearing, he said, I would have drawn only two Democrats if I could have figured out a way to do it. I mean, that's, that's what we're up against. You know, that, that's the thought, you know, how can we hack this system to get the most benefit for our party? So, um, you know, I, I expect that it, it will continue. Um, I'm going to try to go through some of the questions that are um, in chat and in Q&A. Um, the first one is uh, that I'm seeing is um, uh, maybe for you, Jane, is there an example of a state where redistricting is done by the legislature, but there are laws regulating how it's done that that create a fair outcome? Oh, Jane, you're on mute, I think. Trying not to talk for once. Um, <laughs> there are states where the criteria are fairly tight and it makes it much harder. Um, but truly the best maps are drawn when elected officials are not part of the process. Um, one of the things we can do in the months leading up to when we finally get the census data is to talk about what we want those criteria to be and maybe even give them some priority. Is it more important to protect incumbents or is it more important to obey county clusters or is it more important to have a compact district? Um, but there's no state that's great. There are some that are better than others. Mm -hmm. um, so I think another question that I'm seeing is, um, what do you think it would take to kind of uh, bring North Carolina to a place where we would actually consider um, doing reform legislation? Um, I know, uh, I think I might go back to you, Jane, for this, because I know that you've been working this kind of beat for a long time. Um, I will say my organization, which was founded in 2005, has been working that this issue since 2005. And as Representative Harrison said, the Democrats were willing to make the change when they were in power. And clearly the Republicans aren't willing to make the change now that they're in power. We're gonna need a legislature where control is by such a tight margin or where one party thinks that the other party is going to wreak horrible revenge on them to, to force legislators to what we have to do is adopt a constitutional amendment um, to change that because our constitution says the legislature has responsibility for drawing the districts. And um, I'll let the lawyers argue about it, but certainly the US constitution says the states determine the time, place and manner of elections. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know if any of, um, any of you all, uh, any of the legislators wanna to add to that. Um, I think, I think, I think, I think, especially from Senator Marcus earlier, it's pretty grim right now. Um, but um, someone was asking if H HR one would um, would have an effect on this, and um, I have not seen looked at the latest version. I don't know if any of you have, but I know that there were things in it that were meant to kind of, um, you know, help end gerrymandering or at least put a lot of pressure on it. Um, so I don't know, Jane, if you have, uh, if you know it a little bit better, but I know that it does have some gerrymandering provisions in it. It has a few, but again, the federal courts have bowed to the states and the state courts on decisions about elections. So I think that should HR1 pass, there 
certainly would be some challenge, legal challenges to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Again, I'll punt that to the lawyers. <laughs> All right, so um, so our time is about up. Um, this was really, really fascinating. And I'm, I'm always happy to talk to you all because you all are so uh, knowledgeable and also such good such good um, fellow fighters for fair maps during these processes. Um, if you all want to kind of uh, leave us with one, with like your top thing that you would have people do right now to get ready for the redistricting process. And uh, Pricey, I'll go to you. Oh, you're on mute. I would just say, um, like, like his Facebook page, pay attention to all online and, and common cause and uh, the coalition for lobbying reform. And, um, cause, cause all we have really, and Southern coalition for social justice, we have really, uh, North Carolina is a incredible, um, resource in the advocacy, uh, arena around this issue. So, um, I, I think there's a lot of great education that needs to go on, but, um, I, I think the most, uh, mostly pay attention, try and get educated about what's important to you. Talk to your neighbors and friends about this. This it's going to be a very serious, um, you know, impact on what North Carolina is going to look like for the next ten years. So our next redistricting, unless we have challenges and more, more redistricting. I just I think um, pay attention, learn learn the issue, and um, once this process gets going, um, everything from establishing the criteria and those sorts of things that will happen before we get the numbers uh, to start drawing the maps, but participate in public hearings um, and. Uh, whine a lot about the need for transparency and public input, please. And thank you for organizing this and having us. Yeah, great. Um, so I don't know, Senator Nichols, Senator Marcus, if you want to add anything to that about sort of your top thing you want people to keep front of mind. Sure. You know, I, I just think public pressure is important. You know, that's all we've got right here. You know, we work for you, you know, and, and no matter, you know, who represents you in the legislature, you've got to make your your voice heard, you gotta make your feelings known, whether it's Republicans, Democrats, you know, if you like what they're doing, tell them you like what they're doing. If you don't like what they're doing, certainly tell them, you know, but make it make it your mission because no matter what issue you care about, it, you know, the, the legislature, it, you know, the map that we have will determine how everything goes on, on in our state level for the next 10 years and, and certainly on the federal level too. You know, it's gonna be a close election for Congress you know, fair maps and a seat or two for Congress could control, you know, the compass, you know, the control of the U.S. House of Representatives as well as our state legislature. So this really is, you know, this this has been my top issue, you know, that that really matters, and, and you just got to make it yours. So I, ho I hope you will will um, follow those great groups that that Representative Harrison talked about. You know, all great resources, and uh, and just do everything you can to to push on this. I'll just add my colleagues have said it most all of it I agree with everything they've said and thank you for hosting this and thank Jane for the work she did I uh, she was there while it was all happening and I would go to her and say what is happening right there because I was new and I needed her help and I needed you know we need to work together many different teams of people who are able to help make this process as fair as we can force it to be um, I will say in North Carolina we don't have a as many protections as we would like to see for our democracy. We saw last week how fragile our democracy can be. We don't have term limits. We don't have restrictions on how millionaires can billionaires can spend their money to buy elections. And if we don't even have fair maps, I mean, it, it, if you care about democracy, you have to care about fair redistricting. And so I know it's not the sexiest issue, um, and it's hard to follow those hearings, but I hope people will continue to care about this issue as, as one, of, one of the few pillars that protects uh, democracy and, and everybody having their one and equal ever so important vote. Well, thank you all so much for being here. This was a really fantastic session. I hope people enjoyed it. I know that um, I always love talking to you all and I always feel like I learned so much from your perspectives and um, you know, everyone look forward to joining us tomorrow. We're starting bright, at er bright and early at 8.30. Um, you should have our schedule and we will send out another copy of it before tomorrow morning. Um, but we're gonna have a bunch of uh, panels where we can ex uh, expand on this. We're gonna have presentations where you're gonna learn more about the census and what's going on with that, where you're gonna learn about how to make effective comments about the latest um, analytical techniques for finding gerrymandering in maps. So um, so a lot of the knowledge that you're gonna need to get started in this and we, we talked 
talked about how important it is for people to learn this stuff ahead of the process, um, you can get started on it tomorrow. So we'll see you all there, hopefully. And thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Thank you. Bye. Good night. Stay safe. Wear your mask. <laughs> thank you, Lida. It was great. Bye. Bye. Thank you.